Hi and welcome to my video series of Biotechnics Explained in 5 Minutes where I explain a concept in biology in less than 5 minutes or so. So if you haven't yet subscribed to my channel, hit that subscribe button and please leave some comment below after watching this video. That keeps me motivated to make more such videos. So today's installment, we'll be talking about genomic DNA libraries. So what comes in your mind when we talk about a genomic DNA library? A library means a collection of books. So a genomic DNA library would simply mean a collection of genomic DNA, right? Okay, so these days it is high throughput sequencing era where we can in fraction of seconds to minutes, we can sequence a full genome. But let me take you to far 70s where sequencing was not so much developed, but people were eager to sequence the genome of yeast, bacteria, virus, and even human. But there was a huge challenge in this work because the genomic size, a mammalian genome would be in order of 10 to the power 9 base pairs, so big, right? Now, there are three basic problems. How to clone such a big genome? Then where to clone it? What are the appropriate vectors which would be useful for cloning such a huge quantity? And then even if we clone it successfully, then how we can like identify our sequence of interest from this library of the sequence? So screening of this library was another challenge. Now scientists were always bothered that, okay, if we try to approach this problem, we should first understand what vector to use. Second, we should understand that even if the cloning is successful, we should devise a efficient uh, strategy. And before that, we should have an estimate that how many recombinant colonies we have to screen. So these were the challenges at that era. Now, human genome, if we talk about the human genome, which is like somewhere around 2.8 into 10 to the power 6 kilobase pairs, and we desired to clone it, I wanted to appreciate that how difficult it would be because let's say we want to clone it and we would restrict restriction digest this whole genome and and let's for a moment assume that we are going to clone it inside a bacteriophage and the insert size the insert of our fragment that we are going to clone would be 20 kb in order to cover this whole genome with such 20 kb fragments we would at least need 2.8 into 10 to the power 6 kb divided by 20, which is approx 1.4 into 10 to the power 5 fragments. At least this number of recombinants we have to uh, screen. But imagine the number is more than that because sometimes some particular fragment would be overrepresented and some fragments would be underrepresented. So we have to, in order to be safe and get the whole coverage we need to screen more colonies now it's still difficult you can understand how challenging it is mathematically to imagine how many colonies to screen now clark and carbon came up with a formula the formula is very looks very simple yet elegant so they calculated number of individual recombinants to be screened based on a probability so they defined a probability p which is including a DNA fragment in a random library. And they came up with this formula. Now, if we consider we want to screen the human genomic library with 95% probability, and provided our insert size was 20 kilobase pair, then plugging in all the values to this formula gives us at least we need 4.2 into 10 to the power 5 number of recombinant colonies to be screened which was the number pretty big that we got earlier so minimum number was like 1.4 into 10 to the power 5 now the number is four times more than the minimum number right now if we want to have a probability which is 99 percent which we are becoming more stringent towards the coverage we have to screen even more colonies and screening 6.5 or 4.2 to 10 to the power 5 colonies is not a joke so it was damn challenging at that time next question is what vector should be appropriate to make a genomic dna library 
So there are two options. One option was lambda fudge. Lambda fudge based vectors are easy to screen. Thousands of lambda fudge vectors could be screened simultaneously and their transformation efficiency is pretty high, even higher than the bacteria. In comparison to that, the carrying capacity of bacterial artificial chromosome is pretty high than these uh, lambda fudge vectors. So bigger fragments, cloning bigger fragments is easier in back. So both the approaches could be taken to clone the genomic DNA library. Now in lambda fudge vector, so their genome is 49 kilobase pair. And few interesting facts about their genome is one third of their genome is just trash. They don't need that. So instead of that particular uh, genomic region, it could be replaced with our gene of interest or the DNA sequence of interest. So we can cut this stuffer fragment out and we can insert our DNA of interest and we can have several thousand plaques created by these uh, lambda fudge vectors. But now question comes, which restriction enzyme to use? Imagine we use a four base cutter or a six base cutter, only one type of restriction enzyme. So only one type of restriction fragment would be generated. Only one type of length would be generated with no overlap with the previous one. Is that advantageous? There are also other options where we use two restriction enzymes, let's say one four base cutter and one six base cutter in combination. And we do a partial digestion, which would give rise to several different random fragment length, but each of them has a probability that it would overlap with some other fragments. So there could be two strategies, but which would be useful. Imagine if you have a puzzle and you know that puzzle gives rise to a picture and you, you get some amount of the information of the previous uh, block, it's easy for you to solve the puzzle. Now, if you don't have any overlap between the other uh, puzzle blocks, it would be a lot more difficult to solve the puzzle, right? So scientists always wanted to have more overlap such that they had more clue and they don't get lost when they're screening the libraries. So that's why nowadays people use a combination of restriction enzymes and do a partial digest for cloning. Now after the cloning, when you get the recombinant colonies on petriplates, you can take them out and you can screen them, sequence them, and you get multiple different sequences of different lengths, definitely, right? Now we, you know that these sequences have some degree of overlap with each other that you can call contigue and then keeping one particular landmark and arranging all this all these contigue on one top of another you can retrieve the physical map of the genome and that is how the scientists solved the uh, this genomic library problem and they really sequence the genome like this so that is how Genomic DNA library was pretty useful at that particular point of time. Now, there are other type of libraries like cDNA libraries, which I had a different video of. But cDNA libraries are different. Genomic DNA library would contain all the sequence, like including introns, exon, non-coding, repetitive sequence, everything. But cDNA libraries would only have the, uh, the, the sequence of exons, which are expressed. Now, cDNA library would only have some sequence of those genes which are expressed at that point of time. But genomic DNA library would have the sequence information for all the genes which are present in that organism at any given point of time. So genomic DNA libraries would, in terms of sequence, would give a better idea than a cDNA library. But cDNA library is useful in its own way. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you like this video, give it a quick thumbs up and please let me know in my comments that how you are liking these videos and don't forget to like, share and subscribe. Thank you.